Today, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Now, you know from listening to this show that our money is broken. Fortunately, we have Bitcoin, a better money that will help us build a brighter future. But if you don't have a Bitcoin strategy and a trusted partner to help you execute that strategy, then you're probably going to fall behind. Now, I've known the Swan Bitcoin team for years. The Bitcoiners at Swan are mission driven and have deep expertise and respect in the Bitcoin space. In my opinion, this is the team you want on your side. Today, I'd like to highlight Swan's private client services division, which guides high net worth individuals and businesses around the world toward building and preserving wealth with Bitcoin. So visit swanprivate.com and learn how this concierge service gives you direct access to your dedicated Bitcoin advisor by phone, messaging, and email. Swan will guide you on complex areas such as self-custody, or you can choose to hold your Bitcoin through Swan with one of the largest US regulated custodians. So make your first purchase with Swan Private and get $100 of Bitcoin. Just tell them that I sent you. You know, an opportunity like this to build and preserve legacy impacting wealth for your family and company will not likely be seen again in our lifetimes. Sign up at swanprivate.com today, mention breed love to your advisor and get $100 in free Bitcoin when you make your first buy. Greg Foss, welcome to the What Is Money Show. What a great spot. I'm really, really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me and uh, yeah, kudos to this cool studio. <laughs> yeah, kudos to the guys and gal here that set us up. Yeah. Uh, this is our first actually in-person recording so you are a very special guest well it's a pleasure you know what uh you and i have talked over the last at least two and a half years certainly right and yeah. uh big fan of yours and a big fan of being here so and it's been quite for me to see you blow up frankly like when you came into bitcoin bitcoin twitter you were just the guy that traded bonds right yeah and but i'm 58 years old and you know i don't I, 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 yeah, you know, and the funny thing is you say blow up, that's a bad word in my uh, <laughs> lexicon because that just means what happens to most bond traders is that's right. how their career ends, right? Yeah. Is they blow up. But uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've developed a Twitter following because, uh, well, two things. I, I really try and tell the truth and I can't tell you how much I hate bonds as a, an asset class, even though I spent, you know, greater yeah. than 30 years of my life trading that asset class. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. So let's, do that. Let's dive into, clearly we call the show, the what is money show. Okay. We like to go deep philosophical and all that government bonds are an interesting one because everyone's heard of them, but I don't think anyone knows what they are hardly. Uh, maybe a lot of people know, understand that they are debt, but it's a very unique class, right? It's a unique asset class is unique category of debt. And it's one that doesn't often get repaid. <laughs> In my analysis of history, at least, that's a, that's a that's true. Uh, when you have a growing debt burden, um, mathematically, government debt does not mature; it has to roll over. Right. So, a thirty-year bond becomes a twenty-year bond, becomes a ten-year bond, becomes a ten-week bond. When it matures, the government just refunds it, re mm -hmm. reissues a term to maturity. But uh, you know what's the good thing about bonds? is they are 100% math. Mm. So there's no subjectivity to them. Um, they are an obligation. They are a fiat contract. And in that sense, that's where the trouble starts. Mm -hmm. They are a fiat contract. So no subjectivity, 100% math, which is what I like about them. But then there's no arguing with the, uh, with the return uh, outcomes and the return profile. Uh, in equities, you have growth assumptions. You have people that price growth to the moon. As we know, equity guys tend to be optimists. And the funny thing is bond guys tend to be pessimists. Mm -hmm. Bond holders, mm -hmm. not a lot of good things happen to bonds. You either get repaid or the bond defaults. And right. those are the two binary outcomes. Right, yeah. And you hear from a lot of people that uh, the bond market tends to tell the truth. Whereas equities can get... Here's the neat thing. There was a time when rates were not manipulated that certainly the bond guys seem to be up on the... Uh, uh, more up on the, the macro events than equity guys. Um, now with QE and uh, yield curve control in various countries, the signals coming from the bond market aren't quite as uh, open as mm. they have, his, have been historically. 
Right. So is that the major problem and the feature that distinguishes government bonds from all the other types of debt is that countries have a monopoly on the currency so they can just print new units of That's currency it. to pay you the know, debt? That's it. I mean, even though you would think, and the, the truth is, the if you define default as not being able to repay the obligation, uh, that chance of default is infinitesimal infinitesimally small in the uh, case of the United States. It's not zero. And mm -hmm. to prove my point, I will just tell anyone to go and look at what's called the credit default swap market, mm -hmm. which is an open market insurance contract on the default probability of the USA. But the reality is it's infinitesimally small. Now, there are 180 other countries in the world, fiat issuing countries, uh, plenty of them do default. Right. Some of them are serial defaulters. I like to say that in my career, uh, Argentina has defaulted four times. <laughs> and the funny thing is that means if you bought a 30 year bond 30 years ago, mm. and not only did it not make it 10 years, it made it, you know, on average only seven and a half years, right? right. Before it defaulted. That's, uh, the unfortunate reality of, uh, lesser credit quality countries, uh, everyone always says about the USA, oh my goodness, the USA is in big trouble. Well, let me tell you something. If the USA is in big trouble, Canada's in big trouble squared. I often say that Canada will default 10 years before the US defaults. Mm. Now, ultimately they will all default. It's pure mathematics and pure history. But, uh, you know, the USA is the world's most uh, secure sovereign borrower uh in close second is the european union but that union is made up of some haves and have nots right mm. and so government debt is a uh prior to concerns about default it was 100 percent focused on inflation expectations my thesis is people are going to have to start worrying a lot more about the default components of the mm -hmm. re return and the compensation you get. So the coupon on the debt compensates you for risk. That coupon generally has been a reflection of forward-looking inflation expectations. But now I argue you're going to have to start pricing in default concerns. Right, right. And some of that default concern, I would imagine, has to do with Bitcoin's emergence, right? The people have Interesting, the ability you know, um, to opt out. I don't think that the large players in sovereign debt have made that link yet. Mm -hmm. I would make that link mm -hmm. and I know you make that link, but we still have to understand that uh, the, the sovereign debt market is ruled by guys that like I'm old, right? I'm 58. It's ruled by guys that are still, you know, 15 years older than I am. Mm. Uh, very crusty old uh, portfolio managers with a lot of experience, but let's be honest. Interest rates over the last 40 years have done nothing but go down. And when interest rates go down, bond prices go up. That's the pure mathematics of it. Um, we're in a new paradigm right now. Interest rates hit a base of slightly under 1% on the U.S. 10-year. I don't believe they're going to go negative. There's people that think they are, but let's even think about what that means. If a bond has a negative yield it's no longer an asset, it's a liability. Mm -hmm. You give someone your money and you get less money back? Right. Hey, that's a great investment. Well, that's what negative yielding bonds are. So mm -hmm. anyone who's hoping that that happens, I think they're pushing on a string. Um, right now, 10-year US rates for a number are at 2.5%. They did get slightly under 1%. When I started trading bonds uh, close to 35 years ago, the 10-year rate was 14, 1.4%. Wow. It just gives you a different idea. Now, here's a really cool thing. Inflation then was lower than it is now. Right. And the 10-year rate was 14%. Right. With CPI at, call it 8% right now, if you believe that to be the number, but let's just take that as the number, and the 10-year rate at 2.5%, you're earning a negative real return. That means subtracting out inflation of negative 5% right. when you own a bond a U.S. Treasury bond, uh, at least in, 2000, in 1985, let's say, when the interest rate was 14% and inflation was, just to make the math simple, call it 8% like it is now, at least 14% minus 8% gave you a 6% positive real really return. Yeah. That's what bonds are. Again, a fiat contract. Let's not mess around 
There is no subjectivity to this. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So let's talk about a couple of those points. So one, inflation itself. I've often described that it's really just governments implicitly defaulting, right? This is the expansion I, I of like the currency that. supply yeah. to pay off these obligations. And so the cost of that default is effectively being externalized onto the productive market society. So is that how you look at inflation? Because I know we often talk about, it used to be a good proxy for inflation expectations, but to your point, yes. now the default's more on the table, explicit default. Yes. Um, that seems to have changed. What a great explanation. You know, and quite honestly, I follow a lot of your stuff, but I have never heard you explain it that way. Um, it's a great way to look at it. I mean, there has never been, you know, an explicit default is when, um, you know, you can't make your coupon payment. The reality is, though, when you can print money, yeah. you can just make that payment by printing more money. Now, you take Venezuela as an example where uh, they were able to print the money, but the money ended up on the, the gar you know, in the garbage on the yeah. curb. Yeah. Uh, in the USA, that hasn't happened yet. I don't want that to happen, but the risk is rising on a daily basis. Um, an uh, implicit default, 1971, right? Uh, that was an right. implicit default. And then when you talk about inflation, um, you know, I, and I'm thinking out loud here, the cool thing is I like the way you explain it. Capitalism with banks that are 25 times leveraged, which is what mm -hmm. our banking system is, which means for every $100 of loans that they make, they only hold $4 of equity capital, and the other $96 comes from depositors money. So mm -hmm. that's your 25 times levered, right? right? They need inflation so that the collateral increases in value. The collateral backing the loan needs to increase in value yeah. because they're only holding four cents on the dollar. Right, in nominal value. There you go. Yeah. And, and that is what banking is. And as Henry Ford said over a hundred years ago, something along the lines of if the average American understood what, how the commercial banking system worked, there'd be a revolution mm -hmm. in the morning. Mm -hmm. So Henry Ford knew he, we needed Bitcoin. Um, I knew we needed Bitcoin in 1998 when I first started working in the, ba in the banking system. That being said, it didn't exist. So when I finally found it, I was like, oh my God, I've been looking for this for 30 years, plus or minus, because... Mm -hmm. I found it in 2016, but you know, coming back to your point, inflation is a tax. Jeff Booth talks about this mm -hmm. really, really well, um, but it needs to happen predominantly because the collateral value for commercial banks needs to have that upward trend. Right, so the debt-based system requires fiat currency expansion just to increase the nominal value of the collateral so that the system is it sustainable. It helps, you know what? It, it, yeah. it, it, uh, as as risks go, that's a lot less right. risky than the other alternative. But that expansion is taxing the productive economy, so it's pushing all these market actors further out along the risk curve, there you go. dispossessing the economically vulnerable, and historically, these systems collapse, right? Like it's there, the History all speaks for itself, yeah. correct. Um, uh, what I'd like to do at this point is just tell you a little bit about my first, you know, welcome to the financial system. Um, I mentioned to our guys here, uh, you know, I'm a Canadian. I went down to the U.S. to uh, to do an MBA. And I came back to Canada, um, worked for the head office of the Royal Bank of Canada, which is the largest bank in Canada. And uh, working directly for the CFO, a lot of people have heard this, but I need to say it again. I was taxed with uh, solving, if you will, or putting our bid in for a Brady plan solution to the Latin American debt crisis that all banks were going through. Uh, Brady plan, Brady, Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady was the uh, uh, architect of this plan. Anyway, long story short, um, Royal Bank of Canada in 1988 was insolvent. Now that's pretty scary. And what that meant was if you had marked to market the Latin American debt portfolio of the Royal Bank, it would have chewed up all its book value of equity, okay? Like mm, it just, wow. you know, we needed, we had $4 billion of exposure. The average debt was trading at 25 cents on the dollar. So we need to write down over $3 billion of, of losses. Mm -hmm. And our book value of equity was less than 3 billion. Now, doesn't sound like a lot of money, but 
1988, you know, in right. today's context, a trillion dollars, 1988 though, a couple of billion dollars was a lot of money. And, you know, I was working for the CFO, great guy. I go to the CFO, Emil, we have a problem. And he goes, I know, don't tell anybody. And I'm like, <laughs> are you kidding me? I just went through all these years of school to find out that our financial system is built on smoke and mirrors yeah. and f comfort. So let's take this a step further. If you are a depositor that puts your money in the Royal Bank of Canada, you probably don't know that it's insolvent on a regular basis with the economic cycle. But what you do believe is the Royal Bank of Canada is too big to fail. Mm -hmm. That the government of Canada will always be there to bail out the Royal and all the other banks in Canada. And that is probably true, um, which means how do they do it? Well, the money printer. Right. And so, you know, as I say, 1988, over 30 years ago, I was like, fiat is the Ponzi. Yeah. Fiat is the Ponzi. And then when I was introduced to Bitcoin, and I don't want to jump ahead too much, but in 2016, I, I was like everyone else. Oh, Bitcoin, it's a Ponzi because I've read in the newspapers that it's a Ponzi. Right. But then when you peel a few layers of the onion, I was like, my God, I've been looking for this <laughs> for 30 years. Excellently said. I would just like to point out here too that every other business model in the world has to be accountable to their own solvency and thus the wishes of their customer. Crazy, right? Or this is the one yeah. you know, industry, I guess you'd call central banking or statism that, that they don't. They just by force take what they need to maintain uh, the Socialized solvency. losses yes. seem to be an accepted way of business. Um, yes. It certainly drives me crazy. Our friend Jeff Booth would say the same thing. But what it means is, uh, you know, you're supposed to swing for the fences because if you, you know, you, you, you make connection with the ball and you knock it out of the park, you gain all the rewards. If you strike out, you have an implied right. government backstop. You have an everlasting free roll, as Isn't they that call something? it in Vegas. Yeah. So socialized losses is a uh, reality with yes. the... Uh, with the, you know, I, I, so 1998, it's 1988 was my first uh, debt crisis. 1998 was la, uh, long-term capital management. Uh, that was my second crisis. And that's a perfect example of socializing losses on yes. Wall Street. Yes. Yeah. And um, to point out here, I think the nature of corruption itself to, if you can bend something that's ostensibly available for public good, if mm -hmm. you can bend that for private gain, that's the definition of corruption, right? Okay. What are you describing here? I guess. Privatized <laughs> gains. Yes. Heads I win, tails you lose. Correct. Right? It, is, it is corrupt by design. This is not an opinion. It's mechanically how it operates. Okay. And, uh, you know, well said. Uh, who was the politician that said, though, that capitalism is the worst for, form of government except for all the others? Right. Uh, maybe it yeah. was Maggie Thatcher or something like that. I, or maybe I guess, it was democracy. Like, I got to be clear about this. I'm a, I'm a capitalist still. I, I mean, because I don't know a better solution. Yeah. Uh, and for the record, I'm a capitalist with a heart, meaning I want to help the less fortunate. Mm. Uh, I'm stealing that line for a, from a famous hedge fund manager, uh, Leon Cooperman. Uh, yeah. Good uh good boy, a good kid from the Bronx that, uh, I think he was from the Bronx, but it doesn't matter. Um, who basically says the same thing. He's a capitalist with a heart. Now he's a, he's worth a couple of billion dollars and he's against forced, uh, taxation of rich people, but he goes right out and says he will give most of his money away, yeah. but on his terms. Right. So, you know, again, so look, I'm a capitalist. I do not want everyone's seems to think that I want the fiat system to fail. I actually don't. I'm just calling out the danger. Right. And in the context that we need to make uh, a parallel system or design a parallel system, because I got three kids and uh, trust me, uh, you do not want this system to fail because if it does, there'll be a, a, a world of pain. Uh, agreed completely. But to your point on building this whole thesis on mathematics and you know looking at history, it always does oh, yeah. fail. No, no, that's, right? that's it's look, either you, got you achieve infinite leverage Correct. or it's going to fail and infinite Correct. leverage is not possible. Therefore, it's going to fail. Mathematically, and I want to walk through that, yeah. the math of the debt spiral with you, but uh, okay, so we know that it's going to fail. We know. Mm -hmm. So let's not mess around with that. 
we just have to hope that the next crisis doesn't happen and the severity of it isn't the one that tips us over the edge. Now, mm. with each successive crisis, so let's walk through them. Latin American debt, 1988. Long-term capital management, 1998. Great, or the, the great financial crisis, 2008. That mm -hmm. was a scary one. OK. And, you know, I was working at a hedge fund and we were uh, we were actually doing pretty well. And I actually thought the world was ending like I was distraught over the fact that it was whatever. What happens in each financial crisis is the severity gets worse and the quickness mm -hmm. of the of the collapse happens. So COVID. That collapse was. The immediate. fastest liquidity contraction in history. Okay, faster than it certainly yeah. felt like it. And if that, yeah. you know, if that's a statistical truth, then I'm not going to argue with it. Um, let's be uh, clear. The next one could be the big one. Uh, it's sort of like the California earthquake. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's going to happen. You just don't want it to happen. Right. You know. Uh, okay. And let let's be clear about this. I I don't want California to have the earthquake either. Right. right. Like, but like, <laughs> you got to play probabilities. My whole life has been spent analyzing risk and when you analyze risk you analyze probabilities you analyze tail risk and you don't focus on the tail risk you just have to acknowledge that it's there yes yeah and this is kind of like the old adage hope for the best plan for the worst yep but we are to be very clear you say ponzi i often say pyramid scheme okay that's exactly what the fiat currency is that it's enriching those near the top correct. at the expense of those near the bottom correct that's obviously not a sustainable model, right? There's going to come a point where you pushed the people near the bottom to the edge of their economic livelihood. Yep. They're going to go over the edge, right? And that's when you get social revolt or you get hyperinflation yes. or these types of events. Let me ask you this. So we talked about rates collapsing for the past 40 years. Okay. What is driving that? What does that mean? What, should, what, what information should we glean from that? Okay, so let's go back to the early 80s. Um, you had a uh, chairman, uh, Paul Volcker, um, and inflation was rampant. Uh, you had the Arab oil embar embargo in the, in the seventies, uh, inflation was pushing up to limits that the fed and Volcker, uh, at that time had the ability to squash inflation because the debt burden of the United States wasn't at a point where if you raise interest rates that high, you don't implicitly put yourself in a in an accelerating debt spiral right. because the cost of your debt was uh, absorbable. Now, mm -hmm. Volcker did it. He crushed inflation. Uh, a, a lot of people would argue, uh, you know, he put the economy through some enormous pain that it otherwise didn't have to go through. But let's, you know, let's not play revisionist history here. Rates went from double digits over a period of 40 years down to below 1% in the U.S. 10-year. Uh, what drove that? Inflation came all the way back down. Mm -hmm. So you can, again, when the, the, the interest rate on a bond is set using inflation expectations and that expectation gets uh, lower and lower, the coupon on the debt goes lower and lower. Um, markets were driven by bond uh, comfort. We often say, and we talked about this, I say that credit is the dog and equity is the tail. Mm. You need to understand what's happening in credit markets uh, in order to understand whether equity is a good purchase or not. Mm. And uh, a bond bull market led to equity overall led to equity price appreciation. You're, you're a pretty good uh, accountant. Uh, you know that uh, when the discount rate that's set on, uh, to set to uh, uh, calculate enterprise value of a corporation uh, on cash flows, when that discount rate gets lower and lower mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the benchmark rate, the US 10 year rate is also going lower, mm -hmm. that leads to higher equity prices right. very simply because the discount rate gets lower yes. and lower. Right, right, right. Absolutely. So it's something I've often thought about, and this is maybe derived from the Austrian economic studying I've done, but okay. one of the key lessons I learned from Mises, particularly his book, Human Action, he makes the case that all government action is a misallocation of capital because it's premised on involuntary exchange, right? Whether it's taxation or inflation, okay. they're basically taking money or wealth from people without negotiating terms. So does that misallocation of capital contribute to the lowering of rates? Is this like basically governments taking in money, uh, you know, via borrowing 
Okay. But then they, they're misallocating the capital to such an extent that they just can't pay uh, the rate on the bonds. Is, is that related to this at all? Um, that one I'm going to have to take issue with in that in a purely efficient market, okay? And, and this is where I spent my life in the corporate credit markets, uh, the junk bond market to be specific. Mm -hmm. um, you have to look at one of the most important things is the quality of management, right? When you mm -hmm. invest in a corporation, yeah. you are investing in the quality of management. Take that, an extension of that to the government bond market. If you actually thought all the governments were buffoons, would you be throwing money at them to, uh, to fund your, uh, or you know, to, to hold your, uh, your capital? And the funny thing is a lot of people actually still throw money at the governments, even though they are a bunch of buffoons, right? Because the 60-40 stock bond portfolio right. is just been there for the last right. 40 years. But wasn't it just for the risk-free yield? So we can argue it's risk-free. Um, that is a- I, I don't know. I, I agree with you that okay. it's not risk-free. Yeah, I'm just saying when, I, when I learned in college, they call it, literally call it the risk-free rate, yeah. which is yeah. also asinine. I agree. The idea that you can get a return without risk in the yeah. real world is total bullshit. Yeah. But. Well, so, okay. Take that to an, uh, you know, modern portfolio theory is based on uh, balancing assets that have correlations that are, uh, mm -hmm. A negative correlation is great for portfolio risk. Right. So bonds and equities typically had negative correlation. When equity prices were getting smoked, chances are interest rates were coming down, which meant bond prices were going up. So that's the whole basis mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, I think he's a friend of yours. Uh, if he's not, he's certainly one of the world's greatest asset managers, Ray Dalio in Bridgewater. That was his whole basis of... Uh, uh, portfolio allocation uh, was that you could leverage bonds and therefore take a larger equity risk because the dampening effect of leveraging bonds when the price of debt went down, the price of bonds went up. Right. If you're getting crushed on your equity, the, <coughs> excuse me, the other side of the trade was you were, your bond portfolio was right, dampening right. the portfolio impacts but that i think well first of all all those correlations tend to go to one in a liquidity crisis oh yeah a la march 20 and they're coming now and they're coming now so maybe is this a good time to shift into the 60 40 conversation or sure. should we build some more well okay. no look here, here's the thing 60 40 was a and, portfolio sorry, could you first yeah explain what that sure. means to the audience 60 40 first. typically meant 60 percent equities 40 percent bonds was a standard benchmark of portfolio allocation. This is assuming that we ignore things like um, alternative assets, which could include hedge funds, uh, private equity. But let's just stick with the 60-40 portfolio. It's a it's a term in, in portfolio management. 60% equities, 40% bonds. Bank it over the last 40 years when interest rates are declining. Bonds have gone up over that entire time, generally, which dampens any equity sell-offs. And uh, portfolio managers and investment policy committees have stuck with that. Hmm. Even now, though, with interest rates at all-time lows, the dampening impacts of bonds and the mathematics are showing that it doesn't work. This is the first quarter in history where the long bond in the U.S. has been off more than 6% and equities are also down. Interesting. No dampening. Quarter, and that's only quarter one, 2022? Quarter one, 2022. Wow. Okay, the, the TLT, TLT, that's the long bond uh, ETF, actually a 20 year uh, ETF is down something like 8%. And the previous worst down months for both included the long bond being down just under 2% when equities were also down. So equities at one point were down over 10% and bo the long bond was also down close to 10%. Hmm. Man, the 60-40, you weren't getting any protection there. Right. You need other assets in your portfolio that will dampen because mathematics are pretty simple. Interest rates, when interest rates go down, bond prices go up, but they started at 14%. They're, they went to 1%. Now they're at 2.5%. When they go from 1% to 2.5%, the bond price goes down. 
Mm. What if they go from two and a half percent back to eight percent? I don't think they can because I think it would cause the debt spiral to to uh, accelerate to to collapse. Right. But history would tell you when inflation is as high as it is right now, interest rates are supposed to be a lot higher than two and a half percent. So that's I actually didn't know that about quarter one twenty twenty two. What does that tell you? What is your opinion of oh, that signal? Pretty cool. You need other assets in there. And the other asset, the best asymmetric opportunity that I have ever seen in 35 years of managing portfolio risk is Bitcoin. Right. What does it tell, I agreed with you on that. What does it tell you about the 60-40 model though? Is it just coming apart because um, the fiat system's coming apart? Or no, you know. Is it a canary in the coal mine of some kind? Uh, it could be. Um, bonds are the biggest asset class in the world, right? Mm. They're far bigger than equities. Right. A factor of four to be, uh, uh, to be and that's global debt, not just uh, bonds, but four times as large. Debt is a reality, as we talked about, of the fiat system. So you're never going to get rid of it. When banks are levered 25 right. times, that is debt itself. Yes. That is yeah. debt in the system. So um, the 60-40, don't forget how these old uh, investment policy committees set guidelines as well. Well, they look at the past, yeah. They don't actually do the math that well. But portfolio theory has actually just evolved in the last 30 years anyway. So 60-40 wasn't even a thing prior to the, to the uh, 1980s because right. interest rates were never at 14%. Right. And once they got there, then 60-40 worked really well. And it's yeah. worked really well for the last 40 years. It's yeah. not going to work well going right. forward. You need to diversify. Because we've hit the zero bound. That's all. It's math, yeah. Robert. That's all, all right. it is. All right. We have hit the lower bound. So let me throw in a couple of things here. You mentioned earlier that you are a capitalist with a heart, okay. which I appreciate. Um, I would add in here for the audience, though, that every a lot of what we're talking about here, anything with a central bank at its core, okay. central bank is anti-capitalist, right? This idea of arbitrary inflation, this idea of yield, uh, yield curve control. Okay. Uh, all of these price controls in general, these yes. are not capitalist Pure, notions yeah, whatsoever, sure. right? This right. is central planning, right. central trumping planning. free market uh -huh. um, price discovery. Also related to this is just the business cycle itself, right? To your point earlier, it's it's gotten worse. The liquidity collapses are happening faster. They're more severe. Also, the subsequent bailout packages, they grow out, well, was it $700 billion in 2008? That's what, what was, it was. What was it yeah. in 2020 worldwide? It's couple of trillion a few trillion yeah, right yeah. so they're they're exponentially growing with each crisis correct is i mean i <laughs> i'm kind of a radical libertarian i guess but i don't see any way to manage or pass a policy or tax or inflate our way out of this do you i mean where do you see things going Here, well in? okay so there is okay let's talk about the pure mathematics of it and this is important because it's grade 11 math. That's my tagline, okay? It's that simple. Total global debt to global GDP. So basically, I'm comparing your total global debt to your tax base, okay? Is four to one. Mm -hmm. Which means if you put an average coupon in your numerator of 3% on that debt, so that includes all government debt, all corporate debt, structured debt, mm -hmm. all the debt, 3% is probably low, but let's make the math easy. Your numerator is growing at four times 3% is 12% relative to your denominator. Right. Is global GDP going to grow at 12% just to keep pace with the numerator? No. No. The, the debt actually suppresses the growth. It does, yeah. but it is just not going to. Global right. growth does not hit 12%. Right. Here is the out. What, what, there is no out, but just that is the de definition of the debt spiral right there. The numerator keeps growing even in the absence of the new deficits spending and the unfunded liabilities that are going to hit the balance sheets of the global central banks. Mm -hmm. You're already at a point where you can't keep up with the organic growth of the debt because mm -hmm. that's all it is. It's a coupon. It is a contract. Here's an out. Inflation goes to 20% and somehow they keep bond yields at 2%. Uh -huh. 
basically the new, the denominator grows because that's right. 20% growth. Mm -hmm. And somehow bondholders are so silly that they continue funding the government at a negative 18% real yield. Is it going to happen? I don't know, but it is a mathematical out. Yeah. I don't, I, you can't say it's a zero probability that it'll happen, but if bondholders are really that foolish, yeah. Yeah, they shouldn't be managing money. Right. And then you're running the risk of just the currency system oh, collapsing. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. no, no. Look, I don't think, look, I'm, I, I, again, I play probabilities and there's no zero probability events yeah. or very few of them. Um, it's a tail risk that you, or a tail event that you should not focus on. Uh, I always say, look, uh, focusing on tail risks is like focusing on the whole of a donut rather than on the donut itself. Okay. You gotta, you gotta admit that it exists, but focus on the donut. Don't focus on the hole in the donut. <laughs> Can we talk about U S default risk and other G seven sure, or G 20 nations? Call, For sure. Um, you know, this is unthinkable. I think to a lot of people, you talk about U S dollar collapsing or, or, you know, even just, uh, an explicit debt default. A lot of people just have that recency bias of it could never happen here, wherever here is, right? We're in the US, so presumably we're in the best position, which yes. I think we are. Yes, you are. But um, the risk is not zero and Bitcoin does change the calculus. So how do you see things playing out? Well, so out? yeah, let's, let's point out why it is not zero. There is actually a market called the credit default swap market that is an open, unmanipulated market for insurance on default. Mm. And there are people right now that are paying for a number 10 basis points a year. It's slightly higher than that, but 10 basis points a year is 0.1% for insurance against the default by the USA over five years. Mm. Okay. Given that there's a market for this insurance and it's not trading at zero, Let's be very clear. There are people that are worried about the right. default of the USA. Now, to take that to an extreme, the default of Turkey, which is much more likely, the insurance premium is a lot higher. Uh, it's about 40 times as high because uh, it trades at about 400 basis points or 4% a mm. year on that insurance contract. But these are all open market rates that indicate concern by global investors over an eventual default of various counterparties. The USA, as I said, in my opinion, is the world's most uh, secure debtor, followed closely by the European Union. Canada is in big trouble. Even though we have a supposed higher credit rating, which is a subjective evaluation by the likes of S&P, uh, Standard & Poor's is a credit rating agency. The credit rating on Canada is AAA, which is the gilt edge, the highest rating that you can get. Whereas the USA is AA plus, mm. but the default insurance market is saying that Canada is much worse shape. We have to pay about, you know, we people are paying 30 basis points a year or three mm. times as high uh, to ensure Canadian government debt as they are to ensure USA. So always look to open markets for truth. I would say S&P's credit rating on Canada is wrong. Uh, and I also believe that the management of Canada is a little suspect as well. When you have a prime minister running around saying stuff like uh, the budget will balance itself, which is what Justin Trudeau said, uh, that's not the type of management you uh, get a lot of comfort in if you're a debtor or a, a lender to this country because uh, budgets don't balance themselves, Mr. Trudeau. Uh, that is an infantile uh, statement. And at the end of the day, if you were the CEO of a publicly traded company, you'd likely get fired on the spot for say, making such an asinine statement. So he said that, and then he also said, well, forgive me, I don't care about monetary policy. Both of those things uh, are a big red flag to, uh, to lenders, in my opinion. Yeah, he's definitely thrown up a lot of red flags in a lot of ways. So do you think we will see a G7 or G20 explicit default in the next few decades? Great question. I pray it's not the case, but Canada will be the first one. First one. Yeah. And then you think U.S. is 10 years after that. I do. But here's the reality. Let's just go down the, the chart to G20s. Uh, Argentina is a G20. It's mm. defaulted four times. Right, right. Uh, Turkey is on its way. It's a G20. Yeah. Italy would be uh, a, a basket case uh, if it wasn't for the European Union or the ECB uh, 
backing Germany in specific. Yeah. Uh, so you have the weak sisters of the European Union. Uh, they were called the pigs. Uh, if you guys remember that acronym, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, thank goodness they have the, uh, now some of them are G7 countries, but, uh, well, Italy, I guess. But, um, uh, you know, Italy, France, these are countries that if they didn't have European Central Bank backing would be uh, in Canada's, you know, quandary right gotcha what does so you look at bitcoin as insurance on this yeah. and so what does that mean exactly that if you were a creditor to certain countries historically that now you need to consider what hedging that is, position in my opinion that's correct and i've written a paper on this and uh uh, basically, since my background is credit, I came at the valuation of Bitcoin using the credit default swap market. But it's based on my belief that Bitcoin is the anti-fiat. And being anti-fiat means that it is an insurance policy on a basket of fiats failing. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty easy to calculate. And I did this uh, in a calculation. I can come up with the intrinsic value of Bitcoin as the only anti-fiat out there uh, based on credit default swap markets for various sovereign nations multiplied by their outstanding debt as well as their unfunded obligations. And let's run through a quick example, if, if I may. And, and you can edit this out if, if, if I'm geeking out too <laughs> much on you, okay? But think of this. The United States has $30 billion of funded debt, right? Uh -huh. And... It has another 180 trillion. So I said 30 billion, I think it's 30 trillion yeah. plus another 180 trillion of unfunded obligations, which is Medicare and Medicaid. So yeah. make the math easy, 200 trillion of outstanding uh, obligations, yeah. the US government. And there's a credit default swap market for the USA in the five year term that trades as I mentioned, between 10 and 15 basis points, depending on the, the, the uh, markets and volatility in the markets. But let's move that out and, and imply what is a 20 year default rate on the USA, meaning the five year rates at, at uh, 10 to 15 basis points. I argue that it's easy to, to, to put a number uh, on a 20 year rate for the USA right around, you know, and again, I'm gonna make the math easy. Let's say it's, uh, it's uh, 50 basis points, okay? So 50 basis points is half a percent and you have $200 trillion of uh, uh, US obligations out there. So just on the US market, 50 basis points is one half of a percent on 200 trillion. So 1% would be $2, two trillion. trillion. So it's 1 trillion. And now we're at half a percent, that's 1 trillion. That's yeah. just on the United States. That's what Bitcoin should be worth just on the United States. Yeah. Well, isn't it interesting? It's Bitcoin's about at a about trillion. a trillion bucks. Yeah. That means you get default protection on the USA plus all the other nations in the world mm. for free. Are you supposed to buy it here <laughs> at 40,000 or 45,000? My advice to everybody out there using that math is you close your eyes and you buy it blindly <laughs> because you're getting insurance protection on the US for fair value mm -hmm. and you're getting everybody else in the world for free. Right. And by the way, everybody else in the world is far Very worse sure. than the USA. How, well, have you added in the other countries? Yeah. So I come up with a number and this is just published in a, in a Bitcoin magazine article and also on an educational platform that I'm, um, I'm part of. Uh, my intrinsic value of Bitcoin right now is over $250,000 per Bitcoin, US dollars. And that's when credit default swaps are very thin. Right. As the default swap market wisens up, right. the intrinsic value of Bitcoin goes, goes higher. So that's a 5 trillion market cap roughly, 250,000 per that's Bitcoin. That's right, yeah. yeah. So it's about half the market cap of gold. That, that's a, a good way to look at it. Now look, I'm not a gold, I'm not anti-gold per se. Um, Bitcoin is going to over 2 million bucks a coin, okay? It's going there. Um, playing probabilities, uh, my price target, it's not a limit on Bitcoin, is 2 million US dollars per Bitcoin. The price right now intrinsically should be 250,000 US per coin, and it's trading at under 50. Mm -hmm. 
all of these are indications of don't overthink this. The price of Bitcoin right now is a rounding error. Right. Go out and buy some insurance. What do you think, as I've done some math like this as well, and I, my, my target's actually higher than yours. I had Bitcoin at 12 and a half million by 2031. However, okay. that 12 and a half million dollars would only have equivalent purchasing power of a million dollars today. Okay. So uh, in this world, a yeah. loaf of bread has yeah, gone yeah, no, that's from fine. five to $60 or something like that. Yeah. At what point do you think the U.S. dollar price of Bitcoin just becomes irrelevant? Yeah, great question. Well, look, I, I got to clear one thing up. I should have been more forceful on this. My price target is $2 million in today's dollars. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, in today's dollars, okay. $2 million. So you're actually more bullish than me. <laughs> uh, well, could be or not. I get there in a very simple mathematics. We could run through it with, with you if you want. But $2 million is a target. It's not a limit. And the other thing I don't do is I don't give a time frame on it. Okay, so mm. you either give a target and no time frame, mm. or you give a time frame, i.e., it's going higher, but mm -hmm. you don't give a target. Mm. So it's just good practice not to give both. Yeah. So I love you for putting one out. You're right but about I'm that. I'm just not going to put a target on it. My target, or excuse me, I'll put a target on it, but not a time frame. My time frame, ah, most likely within my lifetime. Who knows how long I'm going to live? And most likely within my kids lifetime for a high larger probability uh because why because that's what it is it's insurance for my children mm. yeah beautiful now i'd like to tell you about a great new bitcoin show on the scene that you've got to check out brought to you by swan studios and bitcoin magazine this show is hard money with natalie brunel natalie is an emmy nominated journalist bringing unparalleled experience to the bitcoin media scene and personally, Natalie is one of my favorite voices in the Bitcoin space. Each week on Hard Money, you'll get the top headlines of the week with analysis you won't find anywhere else. Hard hitting interviews with amazing guests like myself and other top minds in the Bitcoin space. And the show will take you directly into the lives being changed by Bitcoin all over the world. Check out Hard Money at swan.com backslash hard money. Today, I wanna to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. So how does health insurance work? You send an egregious amount of money to an insurance company. They hold it in a pool of depreciating fiat currency. Then when you have a large health event, you have to pay them even more via your deductible. And then you hope they will cover your bill. And in fact, one in six bills are denied by healthcare.gov plans. It's time to take control of your own healthcare bills. I'd like to introduce you to CrowdHealth. It's a decentralization of healthcare using Bitcoin as an alternative to health insurance. Instead of sending fiat currency to a big corporation, you send that money to an account controlled by you, a portion of which is converted into Bitcoin. Then if you have a big health event, you have a community of Bitcoiners that will use the money in their accounts to help you out. To get more details, go to joincrowdhealth.com backslash breedlove, where you can find the promo code for $99 a month for six months. And that is one of the most beautiful things about Bitcoin is that it does just, you know, the, we always say lowers your time preference. Yes, But um, I think that's equivalent to saying elevating your morality in a way. And that you start to just care about longer stretches of yourself into the future, including like more future generations, more present others, all of this. So I'm a boomer. Um, so I'm 58 years old and I'm looking right into the camera here. I'm calling out all you other boomers who are the most <laughs> selfish bunch of Fs that I've ever met in my life, okay? <laughs> you people are so weak, okay? Because we have pulled forward gains that should accrue to our children because we're too scared to deal with the realities, okay? Mm -hmm. One of the craziest things I just saw is Quebec, my home province, uh, is now giving taxpayers a tax break because inflation is so high. So Quebec causes inflation by printing money. <laughs> now they're gonna give people a tax break, which essentially is the same thing as printing more money because inflation is too high. Yes. You soft MFers. Like, Grow a backbone for Christ's sake, okay? This is absolutely despicable when you have politicians that are trying to get another four years in yeah. power by throwing out tax uh, advantages that will 
uh, try and get them more, but as you know, oops, excuse me, will uh, hurt the uh, lower the lower yeah. class more than the than the, uh, the, the, the more privileged, right? And this is the absurdity of fiat, by the way, is inflation's too painful, so we're going to print more money to oh, man. give you a remedy to the inflation, but the very printing of that remedy is going to cause further inflation. Isn't it something? I mean, this is one it's, aspect it's, it of that the, debt well, spiral. Well, it's the Ponzi. It's yeah. the Ponzi. That is the Ponzi in itself, right? right. So um, uh, we don't have to confuse it. It's really that simple. Mm -hmm. It is grade 11 mathematics. I really, it blows my mind that people cannot get past the reality of the debt spiral. When Volcker started this in 1980, the U.S. debt to GDP was, you know, 60%. Now the U.S. debt to GDP, this is just the United States, is well over 120%. Mm -hmm. You can't react the same way. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you have to do things like yield, co yield curve control. You have to do quantitative easing forever. So QE infinity, look, they're not going to call it that, but it's a reality. You have to print money to solve the debt spiral. That is the closed loop. When you have a debt spiral and you can't pay it, the only way you can make everything balance from an accounting mm -hmm. perspective mm -hmm. is by printing money. Absolutely. That's called QE infinity. That's why you need Bitcoin. And I would throw in here, and maybe we can talk more about the debt spiral, but this idea that you need to print money ad infinitum to keep the pyramid scheme going. Uh -huh. It seems pretty intuitive to me that in that world where everyone wants to print money, everyone can print money now via crypto, the money that nobody can print, which is Bitcoin, wins, right? That's where everyone will That's necessarily store their wealth because it's the one asset that is untouchable in this world where everyone else's assets are getting manipulated. And the key thing is it's untouchable because it's decentralized, right? They, yes. You know, you had this latest thing, well, we'll just change the protocol to make, to change it from proof of work to proof of stake. <laughs> this was the environmentalist. Like, good try, guys. Um, you know, that's not how the world works. No. But anyway, uh, proof of stake is equity, right? You own enough equity of a company, proof of stake means you can control the outcome. Uh, lots of tokens are that, that claim to be decentralized, uh, certainly uh, if you examine, are, are not quite. Mm. And Bitcoin is the only uh, true decentralized protocol. And don't, if you don't trust me, everybody needs to read the Fidelity research report. Mm which Fidelity, as everyone knows, or if you don't, Fidelity is one of the world's largest asset managers. When Fidelity talks, every other asset manager in the world listens. And Fidelity basically published a research on uh, digital assets. And I'm gonna paraphrase. There's Bitcoin. Now these are, this is Fidelity, me paraphrasing Fidelity. There's Bitcoin and then there's shit coins. Okay. Like <laughs> you don't have to read between the lines. That's basically what they said. There's right. Bitcoin and there's all others. Yeah. And this is Fidelity. This is someone who, trust me, when you're out there as an asset manager where I spent my uh, career, if Fidelity, which is one of the biggest, is offering digital assets and as a view on digital assets that are going to help grow the ecosystem and you're out there preaching, oh, no, no, we don't have to worry about it you're going to be out of business because mm -hmm. the client that comes to Fidelity because they offer a diversified suite of bonds, equities, and now digital assets, if you don't offer that silo, you're losing your, your client to Fidelity. It's just the way it works. Yeah, I, I've glanced at the report that you're referring to. And honestly, for me, it's just staggering to see that level of firm saying something like that. As a Bitcoiner, you know, you've been around for a few years because three four years ago this was absolutely so the beautiful it was thing, anathema to talk about bitcoin at that level so if i could use a bit of my experience again i i got my start as a junk bond trader uh junk bonds in the usa were accepted in the u.s about 20 years prior to them being accepted in canada as mm. a diversified a diversification right, right, right. Yeah. and so i i will tell you this I grew up in Canada. 
pitching an asset class that started being, uh, we don't need it, junk bonds, they're too risky. Right. And, and you know, just to take it to an extreme, well, uh, sir, you already own all the equity of the same company. Uh, if you think the bonds are too risky, you should probably understand capital uh, <laughs> priority of claim because then you own a subordinate claim, you're a fool. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of foolish money in Canada, much like there is everywhere. But point being, 20 years ago in Canada, high yield bonds were not an accepted asset class by and large. Right. Equities were for growth and bonds were for capital preservation and high yield. If you're a high yield company, go to the United States and fund yourself. Um, now everyone in Canada has a high yield bond asset or a yep. silo. And the same thing is gonna happen with digital assets. Look, mm -hmm. digital assets are only 13 years old. It doesn't change overnight. Investment policy committees are staffed by old guys that are older than me and they don't want to risk their entire uh, reputation. So no. what's the easy thing for them to say? Follow the herd. Follow the herd. No. I, digital assets. Warren Buffett says digital assets are rat poison. So uh, it's got to be rat poison because uh, Warren <laughs> and Charlie are so darn smart. Uh, you know, here's another tagline. Yeah, they're rat poison because fiat's the rat. Okay, that, that's hundred percent where I was gonna go. With yeah, that. Man. <laughs> and Charlie Munger, all due respect, uh, he's conflicted and he's also soggy. Okay, yeah. his time has come and gone. Uh, Ninety four years old, I would not be running to him to get uh, investment advice on technology. Okay, well, I've missed um, every major tech play in the past decade i mean i think they just bought amazon less than two years yeah, ago Yeah, now they're big into alibaba because you know charlie loves uh, the chinese and that that position's uh sort of carved him a new arsehole uh that's what sh you know he's that that's what happens in markets yeah it's funny too with charlie because he has that famous quote that show me the incentive and i'll show you the outcome yeah and i mean that's so essential to understanding bitcoin i think that I it's think just a vortex of positive incentives you and can't turn and it off. why is he not embracing it? Because he knows that Bitcoin will disintermediate about 50% of his portfolio right, because he's in, he owns yeah. all the American Expresses of the world. He yeah. owns huge in the, in the banks, right? Wells Fargo, uh, not as big in Bank of America. But look, Bitcoin's going to absolutely disintermediate all those. And that means that his portfolio could get carved. And... Uh, so you know, his incentive is for it not to get carved. Yeah, so he suffers from incentive blindness. That's fair. In addition to being uh, very old and not very good guy, in, look, okay, in touch with you know, a lot of people love him, and uh, and and far be it for me to say I'm even a half of as good as investor as they have been, but mm -hmm. I have sat in the trenches. The reality is, when the information changes, you need to change your portfolio. Right. You can be really stubborn and not change your portfolio as the information changes, and. I know how that ends for most people. Now it takes a lot longer for a Buffett and a, a Munger to go out of business than it takes for a Greg Foss to go out of business. <laughs> and then they, there's guys like Shifty Pete who uh, has successfully done it. And I don't know what he does for a living, but he shouldn't be managing money. He's a horrible risk manager, but he's admitted as much. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he's doing to monetize the Twitter trolling, but he's it's good at that. Got to be doing something. He's good at it. <laughs> um, okay, let's shift gears a bit here at bitcoin you know liz warren said bitcoin is a belief well i believe there's intrinsic value in it we've uh we've uh talked about how i get to my intrinsic valuation but uh yeah look every investment is a belief that's there's nothing so what you believe in something is that make it bad no it, a, a price is open market determination of people's beliefs 100 percent. that's all it is 100 yeah. percent. i will we can actually have a little point of contention about this. I hate the term intrinsic value. Okay. Because value is subjective, right? Okay. It's relevant to the aims of the market actor. So we could put a block of gold on the table and say, hey, uh -huh. this has a ton of market value. But if I take that same block of gold to one stranded guy on a deserted island, yes. the gold is valueless to him. Correct. Right? He's got no trading partners. Uh -huh. it's not, he doesn't have money. So I hear what you're saying. Like yeah. there is a way to value Bitcoin. Yeah. I just don't like the term intrinsic so, value because another reason guys like Peter fucking Schiff throw around that term, right? To disparage Bitcoin. Well, here's the Gold funny thing. He, does, value, he says there's no doesn't. intrinsic, right? right? So my this is basically me coming out and saying, well, Shifty, this is my intrinsic value. You could mm -hmm. buy it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but I come up with a price uh, that's far in excess of what its current trading price is. So look, I'm a trader by, by career. Uh, I just play probabilities and I need to be clear about this as well. I actually own some gold. Mm. Oh, shame on you, Foss. Well, look, 
What I don't own is bonds, okay? I do own some equities. I do own other hard assets like real estate. And my biggest and most important hard asset holding is Bitcoin, mm -hmm. but I'm not 100% in. It's not the way I manage risk. Yeah. And that being said, I don't have to be 100% in in order to reap extreme asymmetric returns from a lower percentage holding. That's why asymmetric trades define careers. Okay, this is once again, the best asymmetric investment opportunity I have seen in 35 years. Mm. Don't take that lightly, people. I'm not saying I'm the world's greatest risk manager, but I have survived four successive financial crises and I changed my portfolio when the information changes. Bitcoin is cheaper now on a risk reward mm. basis than it was when I first got involved in 2016, when the price was under a thousand bucks a coin. The reality is better asymmetry now because of our response to COVID. Yeah. And these are actual, uh, you know, results. We're not going on perceived results or projected results. The government response to COVID globally has ensured that Bitcoin is a better asymmetric return, in my opinion, now than it was in 2016. Agreed with that. Um, let, let me ask you, what was your aha moment with Bitcoin? Yeah, great question. You know, so I'm an engineer. Um, I'm very visual. And I grew up in Montreal. Uh, I actually have a, uh, a business. Uh, I'm a partner in eight Irish pubs in Montreal still. All right. Nice. And uh, so I'm sitting at one of these pubs and a mutual friend from Montreal comes up and he introduces me to Bitcoin. And I'm like, come on, man. Look, I spent 30 years. And this guy used to work at Fidelity, to be quite honest. And I'm like, okay, you're smarter than this. Like Bitcoin is the Ponzi that we all read about. He said, no, no, come on, this and this. He explains the attributes. And he says, let me show you the blockchain in action. And he took me to tradeblock.com mm -hmm. on his phone and showed me the blocks being built. Mm -hmm. And he showed me the mempool and global transactions taking place. And I was blown away. I'm like, wait a minute. There's only 21 million of these things. Nobody controls it. And I can watch this living, breathing thing right here in real time. Man, I was in love. Okay. Yeah. I'm like, this is the most beautiful technology I've ever seen. I can send this anywhere in the world with no intermediary and I control my own monetary energy and I can watch it in real time and I can track it. And, and I'm like, love, I was right. in love. Now I'm look, I'm not particularly geeky at the end of the day, there's way better engineers than I am. Uh, but I understand mathematics pretty well. I understand conservation of energy and monetary energy. I love what Michael Saylor, the way he paints the, he mm -hmm. does it way more eloquently than me. What I bring to the table is 30 years of mistakes, okay? Mm. And none of them have killed me. Hmm. That's how you manage risk. All I bring to the table is 30 years of mistakes. Don't make the mistake of listening to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger on Bitcoin. They are wrong. Mm. On a probability adjusted basis, they are wrong. Yeah, that website you referred to is gorgeous kind of shows the blockchain and somewhat of an aesthetic form and yes. i think too your the idea of risk the concept of risk like this is one of the key ingredients to understanding bitcoin is that to own an asset that is of minimal counterparty risk right to, to own an asset that Not is minimal as immune to the opinion of everyone else Isn't in the world beautiful? as anything else like that's the key value problem so, so let's run through why i think it goes to over two million bucks okay pretty simply building on michael saylor's uh conservation of energy theme i think the time will come and we seem to be getting closer to that as putin moves in his own uh, circles that Global energy will be priced in Bitcoin. It makes mm -hmm. sense, right? Bitcoin mm -hmm. is digital energy, digital monetary energy. Why would you sell your valuable natural resource energy for debasing US dollar fiat? I mm -hmm. mean, I know it's the petrodollar and that's the way it's been done. But if you have a choice, wouldn't it be more logical to sell natural resource energy for digital monetary energy? Mm -hmm. That's the conservation mm -hmm. of energy principle, the first law of thermodynamics. That's what Saylor says. 
Uh, he's a rocket scientist. I understand rocket science, but I'm no Michael Saylor. Um, what I do is manage risk and probabilities. Stick with me on this. I think Bitcoin will eventually be used to price natural resources. When that happens, natural resource energy, when that happens, it will supplant U.S. Treasuries as the global reserve asset, okay? Total financial assets in the world, and we've talked about this, my number, not your number, includes all global debt. You're an accountant, so you typically net out debt, mm -hmm. okay? You're a book value guy, I'm an enterprise value guy. Mm -hmm. or you're a market cap guy, I'm an enterprise value. But stick mm -hmm. with me, ladies and gentlemen. Total global financial assets in the world, 900 trillion US dollars in today's dollars. That includes 400 trillion in debt, it includes uh, 100 trillion in global equities, it includes $300 trillion in global real estate. Uh, all in all, you get to $900 trillion fairly easily. Uh, if Bitcoin were to become the global reserve asset, is it crazy to think that Bitcoin would capture 5% of that total addressable market? Now, again, it's in today's dollars. So what's 5% of 900 trillion? That's 45 trillion. What's 45 trillion divided by 21 million? There's your $2 million price right. tag for Bitcoin. Uh, and that's at a 5% market share. Hmm. What if it becomes 25%? Hmm. Okay, so then put probabilities on that, okay? Because this is my target. Now put a probability. I'm gonna back out the probability that the market's giving me, Robert. And this is key. This is how I've always managed risk in my life. My price target in today's dollars not crazy, 2 million bucks. It's trading at 50,000, mm -hmm. okay? That's one in 40. Mm -hmm. 50 divided by 2 million is one in 40, which means a 2.5% chance is the market giving me that I'm right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm not 100% certain, but I'm way higher than 2.5%, mm -hmm. okay? So don't mess around. Hmm. Just buy it with your eyes closed and we'll talk <laughs> in 20 years. <laughs> so funny. Very accurate. Um, I like the math, I like the math approach. When you say buy it with your eyes closed though, that's what I think is funny. Uh, that's what, it's an expression. It's a bond trading expression. Okay. Like ah, okay. sometimes people overthink. Okay. And I'm trying to get people not to overthink. Gotcha. Again, it's focusing on the tail risk. Oh, what if the internet stops working? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a way bigger problem. What I was imagining, if you buy it with your eyes closed, you're going to end up buying XRP instead. Uh, or something. No, <laughs> it's this expression. Okay. So there's an old expression. When you're trading in the pits, you close your eyes and you wave it in. Okay. Ah, okay. So you're waving it in. This is selling. You huh. sell it with your eyes closed. Huh. You buy it with your eyes closed. You don't even know who you're, you're looking at because generally when you're in the pits, you have to identify a guy and you're doing all this shit. It's just, fuck it. I'm buying it from everybody, okay? I'm closing <laughs> my eyes. I'm buying it from everybody. That's so cool. I didn't know that at yeah. all. Um, okay, maybe we can pivot to something a bit more personal. Sure. So you mentioned actually just before we started that you had kind of a, I guess it's just a personal story. I don't, I don't know where to, to open it up really that... Um, I mentioned to you about how Peterson had been impactful on me okay. in my life when I had gone through some dark yep. times, the idea of taking on as much responsibility as possible and okay. how much that can enrich you and improve your life. And you came back at me with a personal said you story. Had, you yeah, said you no, had a story there, so yeah. I, I'll just open oh, it yeah, up to sure. you. Oh yeah, sure, and I, I, I'm quite open about this. Um, look, I had been trading for, uh, as I say, you know, and I'm Bitcoin bingo. You've heard of that? So all these uh -huh. Bitcoiners are like, oh, 35 years, Foss. How long is it going to take Foss to say to people he's traded for 35 years? And they've actually set up Bitcoin squares or bingo <laughs> squares for me. So fuck you guys. Okay, here's my bingo square. Yeah, 35 years of trading risk. Um, that takes a toll on you. Okay, uh, and it took an incredible emotional toll on me. Managing money is a horrible business. Uh, in orders uh, of magnitude it's easiest to lose your own money you still feel like a donkey but yeah. you lose your own money it's only your own yeah. money you lose a bank's money uh well you get fired but the bank has tons of it and if you're managing money for friends and family which i did uh in my hedge fund days uh even if you're doing better than your benchmark but you've mm -hmm. lost money for them it's like you go to them and you say well look the index was down 25 percent, and i'm only down 10 so i should be a hero mm -hmm. that's not how it works you feel like a doorknob um, and it takes a, an emotional toll. And I did reach, I, I retired in 2015 from the hedge fund business. Um, I, I 
not going to blow smoke, but we had a pretty good career. Uh, our fund made tremendous amounts of money coming out of the global financial crisis. Um, and it was time to hang up my cleats because uh, I was emotionally drained. Mm -hmm. But there were a number of other things in my life that were impacting it as well. Um, uh, my son's a pretty uh, intense hockey player. I was living vicariously through him. Uh, that emotional, uh, you know, is an emotion. And then my parents both died in uh, quick succession. And as the oldest guy in my family, I had to, I was the one that needed to take care of their estate mm -hmm. and everything. So uh, I had those three events that were putting pressure on me. And the only one I could control directly was my job, meaning mm -hmm. I want out. And yeah. so two years to the day after I, uh, I, our, our hedge fund got bought, I put my hand up and I was an emotional wreck. And I said, guys, you don't want me managing money anymore. Okay. You mm -hmm. don't. Because it's a game of, uh, it's like you become an addict, right? You always have to get a bigger score. You mm -hmm. know, it's like a bigger hit. And I'm like, I don't want to try and outdo my last trade because that was pretty incredible and I'm not going to be able to do it. All I'm going to do is take more risk and probably blow up. Mm -hmm. And I'm not interested in blowing up. Anyway, I retired under extreme stress. And then what happens when you retire is you start feeling like you're worthless. You don't mm -hmm. have a job. Mm -hmm. And so that impacted me. And I, I, I came into a very deep, dark spot. Um, hmm. I was suicidal. When was um, this? What year was it? Uh, so this was 2017, 18. Okay. Uh, right up to COVID. I was wrestling with this for, uh, call it 2018 to 2020. And when COVID hit, that was about the worst time that COVID could hit because then I felt utterly uh, yeah. uh, detached from uh, feeling a net, uh, net worth or net contribution. So um, I luckily with the support of my family and friends and uh, you know, my kids even, they were superstars. Uh, I helped dig myself out of the hole. Uh, part of it was, there's no question, was my attachment to the Bitcoin community, okay? Mm. Um, can you believe that I got like 90,000 people on Twitter that think I actually know what I'm saying? <laughs> Which is funny. <laughs> because there's a lot of idiots on Twitter that have no idea what they're saying and they get a lot of followers. But I think that the Bitcoin community is probably the most uh, caring and, and beautiful community that I've ever uh, uh, interacted with. So uh, I got to know you, I get to know guys like Jeff Booth, I get to know, uh, well, here's a neat story. So I'm involved right now in this project to bring education, financial education to the world for free. And it's mm. six other Bitcoiners or five other Bitcoiners. And we just launched this thing and it's called, I'm going to pitch it on your show here. It's called uh, Looking Glass Education. Mm. And it's up and running. It's a website that has financial education that you don't learn in school. Mm. Okay. You're not going to learn this because it's, not Keynesian brainwashing. This is reality. This is how you should be looking at managing financial risk. Obviously, the conclusions lean heavily towards Bitcoin, but the community I'm working with includes a 26-year-old kid from Whistler, Canada, by way of uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, Seb Sebastian Bunny, who is 26 years old or 29 years old. This kid's a rock star, and he's doing this for free to help other people. Uh, there's a a surgeon from Madison, Wisconsin, hmm. a trauma surgeon hmm. who read one of my papers in Bitcoin magazine. He goes, Foster, dude, I love what you're saying. I just don't understand it. Can you help me understand hmm. it better? So there's him. Um, there's another hedge fund manager, James Lavish, who is uh, based in Las Vegas. We have a guy from Australia, Daz Bea, who's a, an electrician or works for the, the utility in, in Queensland, Australia, that's giving his time for free to mm. donate material to this website. And then we have uh, Pleb Music, who is uh, Max, and I don't even know Max's last name, but he's Sa Saifedean's uh, uh, video guy. So the five of them plus me have put together this uh, education platform that's now launched. We were going to do it officially at the Bitcoin conference this week. Uh, but very proud to be part of that. And that gives you a sense of the worth that, that I was lacking, okay? Yeah. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I'm just saying I've sat in a risk chair that other people haven't, okay? I, I, I'm not saying I'm better than anybody. I'm just saying I've lived some stuff that you have to live 30 years to, 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 to understand it. I had, first of all, congratulations. I had no idea you were getting in on the education game too. Yeah, pretty proud. Um, you, you know, that's the impetus behind this show oh, largely Same is thing. Yeah. I was also managing other people's money and taking yes. a real emotional toll oh, yeah, on man, me. That's, yeah. 
And then my real and the, our benchmark of all things was Bitcoin, which is which is really hard to outperform. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the impetus to like drop that and move just shift the focus to education ultimately because I guess getting into Bitcoin, you realize how little, first of all, you know about the world and yes. money and all these things, but you do, you learn a lot getting into Bitcoin and there's a big, uh, big desire to want to share that with other people. There's a big appetite, I think, for people out there that want, you know, surrounding this technology that want to know more. So if you can contribute to that, my light bulb was, hey, I could just buy and hold Bitcoin, stop spending all my blood, sweat and tears trying to outperform the thing. Yes, pick up my blood, sweat, and tears and put them towards education, I, which is something that was my writing and talking was and becoming like popular. Head, yeah, and and, I, and I give some you. credit to Mr. Sailor as well as he was the first guest on the show. And you know, that's his oh, really? thing is he has the Sailor Academy, yes. his whole philanthropy about free education. Yeah. So um, I really think it's like one of the highest pursuits we can have today because the world is rife and drowning in fiat bullshit, right? All these you know people changing their gender to a flag or thinking that they can override biological reality with opinions about reality or thinking we can just print money to solve our problems. I think all these things are related, right? This, this idea that we can somehow impose opinions onto the world. I just don't think it works. So I, I hope I that this education yeah. helps people and helps the world. I, I would agree. And so hats off to what you're doing. I'm pumped to be part of this uh, education uh, platform because you know, Hey, here's a neat thing. A, a shout out to uh, Dylan LeClaire, who a yeah. uh, big fan of his, and he's just turned 20, I think. So in one year, he'll be able to drink uh, officially. <laughs> um, so listen, Dylan, uh, I met him and he go, I go, Dylan, why did you leave um, University of Vermont? Uh, and he goes, I was sick of the Keynesian brainwashing. Okay, this is after one year of college. Good for him. And, and, and uh, I'm, I like that resonated with me. I'm like, this kid has it all together. He was able to call out the BS uh, and, uh, and, uh, you, you know, make a, a life choice that I know is going to reward him. Incidentally, his mom is such a great person as well, who I've gotten to know in yeah. the Bitcoin Twitter community. Um, all is this to say, uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, life is full of givers and takers. Uh, most of the world are takers. I'd say 85% of the world are takers which leaves 15% who are the givers. But on Wall Street and Bay Street, where you and I uh, cut our uh, teeth, 99% uh, of the world are takers, okay? <laughs> like it's just one ass, uh, you know, a zero sum game, one a-hole after another trying to steal your, uh, yeah. either your ideas or inflict more pain on your positions or just taking a bonus because, you know, it was their right to have a bonus right. regardless of their- let, uh, let, me, let me ask you, why, why do you think there is so much bullshit in the traditional education system? I mean, I guess we could just focus on Keynesianism and the, the economics yeah. miseducation that so much of us get. Is it by design? I think it might be, right? Isn't yeah. it part of the whole fiat uh, construct that you have to uh, pretend that, uh, you know, first of all, why don't we teach money in school? Right. The most important thing that people are uh, need to learn in their life is financial responsibility. But how many budgeting courses are taught in school? How many true risk analysis courses are taught? Uh, even if it's in, in very elementary form, understanding the difference between a bond, an equity, a commodity, an option, all of these should be grassroots or base foundations of knowledge mm -hmm. for most people. Cause after all an option, just cause it's a financial option that can be measured with a price. Life is full of options and you should be able to mm -hmm. approach those options with the same sort of discipline that you're supposed to approach a financial option. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've said this before, but I'll, I'll share it with you. Sailor said to me once that you could sum up the entirety of business school education into one sentence, which oh. was keep your options open. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, and yeah, but we don't, that line of education is just not there in school, right? There's, yeah, it's traditional, right? Um, maybe they're scared. Uh, that being said, look, I think that it's like everything, it gets stale. I think there's mm -hmm. open, uh, hopefully there's openness to, uh, to change that. It'll come from the bottom up. It'll, it'll be something that the world demands rather mm -hmm. than forced from the top down. Yeah. Uh, that's why we're working on this, uh, this education platform. 
uh, I'll just shout out to the young kids out there. Dylan LeClaire, Seb Bunny, uh, Will Clement. These kids know way more at the age of 20 and thir- under 30 than I knew. I probably still don't know. And, you know, but certainly when I was 45, this stuff was becoming clearer, mm. but I was 45. And um, again, Robert, we've sat in chairs managing risk uh, that a textbook will tell you it can't possibly exist. Right, of course. And I'll tell you one of the greatest trades I ever happened in my career, I was working for our CIO at the hedge fund and I had put together an absolutely risk-free trade, zero risk, infinite return on capital. And he didn't believe it. He's like, you can't possibly be doing this because this thing is not able to be done. And it involved debt of a company that traded in the US. It was a Canadian company, options that traded in the US, but the common stock traded in Canada. And there was an information uh, uh, imbalance between those parts of the capital structure. And I was able to buy put options on the common stock and purchase the bonds that matured within the timeframe of the option at 60 cents on the dollar, which implied if the, if the bond wasn't worth a hundred cents on the dollar, the stock is worth zero, right? Which means the Hmm. put option is Mm -hmm. a great purchase. And my CIO, who's a Harvard MBA looked at it and it's like he got upset with me for finding it. Okay. <laughs> and he's, his name's Jason, a great guy, Canadian guy. And he's on his way to a meeting. And he's like, Foster, it's, it, you cannot possibly be doing this because they don't teach you this at Harvard. And I'm like, that's right. They don't. <laughs> this is something that exists in a market and you have to sit in this risk chair. And he was so pissed off. He was walking out of the, the room off the trading floor. And I go, Jason, how much can I do? And to his credit, do infinity was his answer. Perfect answer, right? Hmm. This is a risk-free trade. Do infinity. So I tried to do infinity and the trade broke down because the market got more wise. But the funny part was we made money on both legs of the trade. The put option Hmm. made money as well as the bonds maturing in the six month window. Uh, 60 cents on the dollar, we got paid 100 cents on the dollar in within a six month timeframe. Point is, you don't learn this in school. You got these guys like Steve Hankey teaching academics who've never sat in a risk chair. And we have to listen to these arseholes mm. as if they know how to manage risk. Right. That's the problem with the system. They have no skin in the game. And they like, never have. They've never had it. And in theory, right. I write this out on a chalkboard right. and, uh, and this is how it's supposed to And you to mentioned go. long-term capital management earlier. Yeah. That was one of the biggest examples of that, right? It was built on theory. And a Nobel and Prize winning theory yes. to begin with. To, 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 you know, a Nobel Prize right. winner, two Nobel Prize winners, if I'm not mistaken, right. at that fund. And was so catastrophic that it caused its own crisis. Basically. Well, they were levered 99 to one. So they were way worse than the banking system itself because the banking system is only levered 25 to one. They used 99 to one capital, you know, leverage rather. And they based their standard deviation on seven years of data. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I'm a Nobel Prize winner. And it's like, the answer, the thing was, yeah, this is three standard deviations outside the the, the mean of volatility. And okay, so you base it on seven years of data. Like, did you think that perhaps, you know, seven years of data wasn't long enough to base an entire thesis on? Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Another fiat mindset. Oh yeah, horrible, but you know, and they're socialized losses, right? Of course. Well, we'll bail them out. Yeah, because I guess the LPs in that fund were politically connected enough that they deserved a bell. Well, the reality was Wall Street had bought so much insurance from them. Mm. And if they weren't going to be able to be good on the insurance contract, Wall Street would have come down. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, let's, I want to talk about one last topic with you. Um, You know, recently there was this, we're recording this now in, what is this, early April 2022, right before the Bitcoin conference. But um, I guess it's been six weeks now since the Freedom Convoy okay. was broken up. Mm-hmm. Were you in Canada at that time? Yes. What, I mean, from the outside looking in, it just looks like, at least from my perspective of freedom maximalism, it's just yet another encroachment by the state on civil liberties. And another aspect of this fiat where it inverts reality, because you have people peacefully, democratically, protesting and then you have trudeau calling them terrorists extremists yeah for doing so 
yeah. like literally inverting the term yeah. of you know from peaceful protest to attacking people Fringe in an, an extreme violent yeah, way extreme. like again th this total yeah. abuse and breakdown of language that inhibits human reason from even working what was your experience of the freedom convoy and its its final outcome so let's be clear i supported it um but i supported the freedom aspect of it i'm mm -hmm. not anti-vax as a uh, in fact i'm doubly vaxxed uh that's more for convenience than belief mm -hmm. but i need to be clear that if my daughter who's 21 years old was uh interested in getting pregnant and scared of taking the vaccination mm -hmm. uh i would not want to impose upon her that she had to take it mm -hmm. um it should be choice so i'm not anti-vax per se i'm a, i'm free choice uh but i supported the truckers uh, for a number of reasons. One was the freedom aspect. The other one was having guts to stand up when the rest of the world was just succumbing like a bunch of wet noodles. Mm -hmm. uh, these truckers organized from both sides of Canada. And if you haven't seen the videos of this, uh, it actually brings tears to my eyes. I'm a very proud Canadian, five generation Canadian. Uh, but Canada hasn't been this proud uh, since we won the gold medal in hockey uh, in the Olympics. Uh, there were flags waving from the bridges as these trucks went by. Um, these truckers were pretty, you know, uh, just average people, right? Mm. They had guts. They, they believed in a cause. And so they rallied from both sides of the country and, and, and congregated in Ottawa. And... Um, yeah, I supported that. I was a proud Canadian. Uh, and then what I'm really more proud of is their discipline to not uh, cause violence in the face of violence being uh, uh, pushed on them. Mm -hmm. uh, I often say that there's more violence after a typical Stanley Cup uh, parade in Canada than there was at this Freedom Convoy mm -hmm. uh, that, that lasted many weeks. I was involved in a fundraise for them uh, with the likes of Ben uh, BTC Sessions, mm -hmm. um, a really s great kid out of Ottawa, uh, goes by the Twitter handle, uh, Nobody Caribou. He was the guy, Nick was the guy that was actually distributing the Bitcoin to the truckers. Long story short, I got caught up in it. Um, I would do it all again. Uh, I mean, my wife doesn't want me to hear this, uh, but... I, d I would do it again because yeah. I believe in the aspect of, um, of freedom of choice. Uh, there is a lawsuit out against us uh, right now. Um, so I'm gonna be careful about what I say, but I need people to understand this is a belief in freedom. Um, it's a belief in peaceful protest, which it was. Uh, it is a reflection of my uh beliefs in canada my my great grand or my granddad rather uh highly decorated uh world war one and world war ii fighter pilot that uh i promise you didn't put his life on the line mm -hmm. not to uh to stand up for something like mm -hmm. this so i'm not a fan of justin trudeau um you know i think the world knows that that being said i understand people that support his views i just think he was wrong and I don't think he was telling the truth. Um, and that's a big problem. Uh, when you have people outright lying about the, the motivations of, uh, of, of the rally and calling them a fringe minority and then realizing, well, they're not quite a fringe minority. They might be a little bigger. So then we're going to label them terrorists. Mm. And then we're going to bring out police and, uh, and, and people to stamp down this uh, protest. Uh, and the most violent scenes that I saw, and I had boots on the ground uh, guys that were there, uh, that saw the violence firsthand as well was, uh, you know, unfortunately was the, the uh, armed or not armed forces, but the uh, men in uniform who I do, men and women in uniform who I largely respect as mm -hmm. well, but they were just carrying out their job. Mm -hmm. um, it was sad for Canada in one respect, but, you know, uh, I actually, in my bag, I have a Canadian flag that I'm going to wave on stage at the uh, at the Bitcoin conference, hmm. okay? Uh, because I'm proud of these guys. Canada uh, was, for a change, a leader uh, in standing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll thank the people that helped uh, the cause, including uh, our good friend, Jeff Booth. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to keep, you know, this isn't about one side versus the other. It's about standing up for, you, you like to call yourself a freedom maximalist. Mm -hmm. uh, we raised money using Bitcoin. Uh, we didn't know that the, that the GoFundMe uh, platforms would get frozen before we mm -hmm. started that 
initiative and mm-hmm. then oh my god it took on a life of its own right yeah I bet. there's truckers who now believe in bitcoin i'm meeting one of the freedom convoy guys down here uh in miami mm-hmm. i've never met him in person but have talked to him he'll be uh he'll, he'll be on a certain panel uh let's just say that um it was a, a crazy moment uh some of the things that happened i wish had not happened uh, including the fact that my family felt very nervous that my bank accounts would all be frozen as well as the, hmm. the truckers and everything like that. So right. living that concern uh, brings out one more use case for Bitcoin that uh, <laughs> that uh, I have to tell everybody. If you would ask me, uh, let's say, okay, so the year is 2022. If you would ask me in 2019, what's the likelihood that Canada, the Canadian government would freeze bank accounts? over the next 20 years, so between 2019 and 2039, let's say, I would say, okay, it's not zero, but what is it, under 20%? Mm. And yet three years later, it happened with 100% certainty. Right. Guys, this is dangerous. And if you think that is concerning, wait until central bank digital currencies become Mm. a use. Oh, Foss, I see you were in Ottawa on the weekend that uh, the truckers were there. And you never go to Ottawa, but we see your spending also coincided with some sort of parade route Mm -hmm. or whatever. Frozen. No. Damn it. I don't want to be part of that. All right? And uh, that's what central bank digital currencies are. They're digital fiat with surveillance. Very extremely dangerous. Uh, It's it's what all the World Economic Forum and all the uh, woke culture want. It's wrong. It's anti-freedom. Be very careful. And don't embrace China just because uh, Justin Trudeau does. Uh, That's a dangerous viewpoint as well. Yeah, I I really appreciate you sharing that. And that notion that it could never happen here. You know, when I talk about the Freedom Convoy with my friends, say in Tennessee, right? Tennessee is very conservative, very Republican. Everyone owns guns, loves freedom. And the attitude... Even in the wake of that, it's like, ah, that's fucking Canada. It would never happen here. Wow. And I'm like, <laughs> guys, you. Yeah. you need to wait. If this doesn't wake you up, yeah. that we, you know, because Canada ranked to number five on the Freedom democracy yeah, index yeah. or whatever it was okay. a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, something um, like two that. Two years later, yeah. literally freezing bank accounts of oh, peaceful man. protesters. Yeah. I mean, a blatant violation of private property. They froze it. And then uh, Krista Freeland, who's. Uh, a right-hand person for uh, Trudeau basically came out and said those bank accounts will be permanently marked or identified as problems. <laughs> well, I'm sort of laughing and I'm sort of not like, damn. This is an attack on Western civilization. In my opinion, yes. Because it's built, we're built on life, liberty, and yep. property. And if you're going to freeze people's most important form of property, yep. I mean, you can neutralize their entire anyway, life. Anyway, just one more example. That was a tail risk that uh that now is a reality uh focus on the donut not on the whole okay (laughs) this is really important central bank digital currencies are very dangerous not surprising that china is uh are are promoting it uh don't uh you know it's 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 like creep right it's it's Mm -hmm. things happen incrementally scope creep Okay. Yeah. 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 And now that the precedent is set, the risk is significantly higher. And the other, the other thing that was very unnerving to me about the whole situation was the total silence across the world. Oh. All Western leaders. There's been one woman in Germany that came out and I spoke loved her. out. But then there was a Croatian guy too, a Croatian I didn't minister, see that one. and he brought up Ceausescu and he said, uh, "Justin Trudeau, uh, you know, you're, you're, you make." Ceausescu look, uh, you know, less dangerous or whatever. So there are some people with backbones um, that are that are standing up to the reality. Um, You know, it's crazy that Justin Trudeau, who's a drama teacher, uh, let's be honest, he never would have become prime minister if it wasn't for his dad. Hmm. And uh, so his dad was prime minister uh, when I was growing up in Quebec. And so he invoked the War Measures Act in Quebec in response to a crisis called the uh, FLQ. It stood for Front de Libération du Québec, FLQ. And they had killed a politician. 
the last time the War Measures Act was invoked was Pierre Elliott Trudeau in the 1970s. I think it was 1972 or 1973. Justin Trudeau essentially did the same thing in response to a peaceful protest and then trampled the rights of ordinary citizens. War measures, it was reframed as something, I can't remember what they called it now, but it was in uh, emergencies, it was called the Emergencies Act. It's essentially the War Measures Act and it was a gross overreach of, mm. uh, of, of power and who's who's shouting it out right now? Right. Not enough people. Not enough. And I did not know Trudeau was a drama teacher because he's a pretty terrible actor, for one. Well, I've he's never a seen drama someone he's not reek just of a drama such teacher. inauthenticity. Almost everything he yeah, says. We got to be careful, though. He's bogus. not just a drama teacher. And by the way, look, this is. But he also was a snowboard instructor. So, uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so look. But but this is not. Pol- Bitcoin is apolitical. Agreed. Um, Let's not break this down into left versus right or whatever. A uh, good friend of both of ours, or I'm not even going to say a friend. I don't want to get him in trouble. Uh, someone who we both talked to, Pierre Poiliev, is, mm-hmm. uh, is coming out with a mm-hmm. different viewpoint for Canadians. Uh, I'm excited about that because it's, uh, it endorses energy. It doesn't make energy companies feel like pariahs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Canada is a natural resource rich country. If we start getting the industry, energy industry in Canada to back Bitcoin, mm-hmm. it could be, it could put Canada on the map globally from a, a financial wealth uh, perspective. Uh, Canada owns no gold. Our, our central bank sold all their gold. Um, if Canada ever gets it through their head that they should put Bitcoin on the balance sheet, I would be so happy. And I think that the default probability of Canada as a G7 nation with the most likely probability of defaulting would decrease rapidly. Uh, It would change industry. I'm involved in a power company called Validus Power, uh, which is a privately privately held uh, energy company, but we have 400 megawatts of behind the meter or off grid power that we are using to mine Bitcoin. Wow. This is big numbers these are things that are going to change the wealth for Mm. generations of canadians uh knock on wood Mm. uh but it's good risk management for the country it's good risk management therefore for my kids who i hope will stay as canadians Mm. uh because i'm a fifth generation canadian and i want there to be six and seven and eight generations of fosses uh in canada beautiful well, I hope to see many fosses proliferating across the continent <laughs> as well. Cheers to that, brother. Greg, thank you for being my first live guest. It's been so good having Serious. you. Serious? Yeah, first time I've done this live. I had no idea. Well, yeah, they've I, all been on I, Zoom well until now. Well done to the, to the guys out here that, uh, that made this happen. So uh, uh, it's, then I'm honored. I'm honored to be, uh, to be that guest. I look forward to the Bitcoin conference uh, great community. Um, and just please do your own research. Don't believe the FUD. Uh, if you own zero Bitcoin, you are taking far more risk than if you own a proper portfolio allocation. What is that proper number for you? That's for you to determine, but it is not zero. Zero is the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. Me personally, I'm around 40% of my net worth is in Bitcoin. There's a lot of Bitcoin maxis out there that are all in 100% and God bless you guys. It's, I don't manage risk that way. I mm-hmm. actually need a house because I have three kids. So mm-hmm. I include that in my, uh, <laughs> in my net worth calculation. But point being, get off zero people that's borrowing from Pomp. Um, get off zero. This is the best asymmetric trade opportunity I have seen in 30 years, bingo. Bingo, put that on your bingo card. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and the only money you can't freeze, which was what we just talked about here. I, is increasingly uh, one more box, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's so beautiful. It's monetary energy. It's the most beautiful technology I've ever seen. Get yourself a Bitcoin wallet. Send some money to a cause or monetary energy to a cause. I've sent monetary energy to an indigenous tribe in New Zealand. Uh, it was a nominal amount under a thousand dollars us it's settled in 10 minutes they can use it for whatever they want if i had tried to use the conventional banking system to send that money to them it never would have got there Mm -hmm. they would have been accused as anti-money laundering Mm -hmm. or or something it wouldn't have settled in 10 minutes it would have tried to settle in probably seven days Mm -hmm. 
And the bank makes it feel like it's their money you're trying to send, not your own. Right. It's a totally different experience. And uh, do it for your kids. For the kids. For the kids, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.